Uh, uh, we welcome you all to another CSDS lecture. Um, we have a historian today with us, Prajit Mukherjee, and he's a, histor uh, he's a historian who's associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And Prajit will have to forgive me today if I mutilate any of the words that he has used in his research, because I'm not familiar with the history of science. Um, it's something um, that is fascinating as I read his work, but there are some words that I'm not familiar with, I'm not well acquainted with, so you have to bear with me. Um, first, I am... He, Project's work broadly falls within the interconnected colonial and post-colonial histories of science, race, and marginalization. More particularly, it can is broadly defined, um, puts it as a history of human difference and race in 20th century South Asia. Project has authored two books already um, related to these themes. One, Nationalizing the Body, it presents a historical account of the creative agency of South Asian doctors in colonial medical establishment. Um, another book titled Doctoring Traditions, uh, it's about the checkered path of Ayurveda during British colonialism in India. Uh, what strikes me reading whatever little familiarity I have with Project's work, is that histories on caste or biometric nationalism are tethered to raciology. Raciology, we can't rest content having wished away race from serious academic discourse anymore. And that is what makes his work very important, especially connecting these themes of race, biometric nationalism and marginality. Uh, as I said, having had an opportunity to read a little of his work, I should confess it was quite an affective experience, a sort of disenchantment over the present disconnect between history of science or science in its avatars, whatever, many different branches of it, and the worldview of our traditional humanities, especially in thinking about human different in, ter in terms of body, senses, and difference, and also power, inevitably. Project brings in insights from history of science, as I said, in its many different avatars, like physical anthropology, evolutionary biology, human genetics, archaeogenetics, and this convergence of the scientific discourse and experimentation, especially within Indian raciology, with the histories of race, marginality, and nationalism is remarkable. And I think we will really benefit, uh, especially the humanities, researchers in humanities will benefit from his lecture. So, uh, Prajit, I invite you to this um, uh, event, and uh, I should say I was also delighted to read a, your work a bit because of the potential that it has in rendering histories of another kind, especially foregrounding the sense of taste, rasa, uh, in thinking about body, race, and culture. And so I look forward to your lecture, Prajit. Thank you, Vijayashree, very much for that uh, wonderful introduction and also for having touched upon what got me into this project in the first place, that when uh, we, uh, when I was a student some uh, 20 years back, uh, when we read about race, we only read about H.H. H. Risley and uh, his, uh, what he did or what he didn't do, and it was as if that after that race went away. Um, after kind of all the histories of race you get kind of end with the First World War. And it, it's almost as if uh, race disappeared after that. And that's why it was surprising for me when I came across this archive. But more about that later. Before that, I just want to take the chance to also thank you, thank CSDS, thank uh, my good and old friend Prabhat for uh, inviting me to give this talk. Uh, my first actual job was at CSDS and one of Ashishda's projects and um, Prabhat used to be my roommate and never got up early enough in the morning when I left for CSDS, but now he's got up, so that's good. Um, I <laughs> like that, but uh, without further ado, let me get to the uh, subject I want to talk about. So I will try and share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay. Okay. So you, you can see my screen, right? That's yes, okay. yes. So, um, so let me begin by introducing you to a rather encyclopedic study by um, uh, S.R. Das, um, who went on to become a very famous uh, geneticist. Um, and Das was at that time, in, this is in 1966, he was employed 
uh, at the Anthropological Survey of India. And as you can see, the title of his article was Application of Phenyl Theocarbamide Taste Character in the Study of Racial Variations. So I want to emphasize the fact that he's in 1966, he's using the word racial variation in the title of this uh, study. So the race is not something that I am reading into what they're doing. Uh, my actors themselves use the category. Um, this was, he was working at the ASI, which of course I don't need to explain to this audience what the Anthropological Survey is. Um, and it was also published in what was then one of their official publications, the Journal of the Indian Anthropological Society at Calcutta, um, or quasi-official publication. Um, and you will see uh, his title also says that data on world taste gene distribution. So this was not just about India. It had four pages of numbers like this. Uh, and uh, don't worry, I won't expect you to like unpack the numbers here. What I want you to see is just the range of groups being used, the range of designations being used. So you have, for instance, the Vadnagar Brahmans or Radi Brahmans, uh, which are clearly caste groups or, or the... Um, the Poddoraj, uh, the uh, Bagdi, these are clearly caste group or the uh, Patidars. But then you also have uh, some at least religious communities like the Muslims of Hooghly uh, are being uh, put in the same bracket. You have a number of so-called tribal groups like the Lipchas, Viangs, Toda, Chenchu. Um, so there's a, this is, this is interesting for two reasons. If you if you have studied about Risley and his ilk in the colonial period, they were always very keen to make these distinctions between caste and tribe and religion. Uh, whereas what we are seeing Das do is he's calling all of these races and he's making them kind of comparable. He's uh, putting all of them in the same bracket. And this is something that is uh, interesting because it signals that the word race is still being used. Uh, in 1966, nearly 20 years after independence, but it also shows that there's something different happening. Uh, and that difference is not just about the methods being used or the word gene and genetics being introduced, but it is also about which groups are being compared and how they're being conceptualized. So what happens to race in post-colonial India? Well, I'll give you two snapshots to kind of set this up. And that's uh, one is from the same year that Das's study was published. Um, and this is by L.D. Sangvi, Lab Shankar Dalichand Sangvi, um, who's really a name to conjure with in the history of genetics. Uh, Sangvi was trained by the people who really created modern genetics. So his PhD committee included Theodosius Dobzhansky, L.C. Dunn, Lionel Penrose, all names were like really massive. Who Modern genetics, any history of modern genetics, these are the people who created it. Sangvi was their student. Moreover, even more importantly, Sangvi was the scientific secretary to the high power UN commission that was set up to study the genetic effects of atomic radiation on the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki after the Second World War. Now, this committee is very important, not just because of what they were studying, but because this actually allows genetics to emerge from the taint of Nazism and uh, present itself as something that is positive, that can actually help uh, improve people's health. Uh, and Sangvi is at the center of all this. So Sangvi is a very important guy. He also sets up the, uh, he's one of the founders of the Tata Cancer Research Institute in uh, Bombay. He sets up India's first cancer registries. He's a really important guy. And what does he say? Well, this is something he's said several times, but this 1966 study was rather programmatic. That's why I'm citing it. And he says, no feature of Indian caste society is more resistant to change than its institution of marriage. Uh, goes on to say a lot of other things have changed, but then says, uh, the regulations governing marriage have been little affected in their essential biological aspect. So this is crucial. Um, if, you, if you now and hold on to that thought. And if you come forward in time to our present this year, uh, there's a there's a massive uh, project underway in India, which actually was constituted under the Manmohan Singh government some decade and a half back called the Indian Genome Variation Consortium. Uh, it connects uh, some of the foremost uh, 
research laboratories in India, government research laboratories, and they're all connected with the intention of creating an Indian genome uh, variation database. So this is the genetic version of your People of India project. Um, and what do they say on their website about their project? They say the vast majority of people in uh, of India, this is a quote from their, um, their project description. The vast majority of the people of India, roughly 80% belong to the Hindu religious fold. Hindus are hierarchically arranged into four socio-cultural clusters or groups, castes, and there are set rules governing marriage within the Hindu religious fold. About 8% of the population is constituted by tribals who are ancestor worshippers and largely endogamous. The remaining belong to other religious groups, Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, Jews, etc. Primarily, marriages occur within the religious groups. In addition, language and geographical location of habitats serve as barriers to gene flow. So what you'll see is this is roughly entirely consistent with what Sangvi was setting up in the 60s or even before that. And the idea is that uh, endogamy is the feature that makes tribes, religious communities, of course, non-Hindu, non-majority communities, Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, Jews, uh, all of these are said to be like castes, perfectly endogamous. And the endogamy has apparently rendered them into discrete genetical pools, that their genes have become specific because they don't marry outside, and this makes them uh, into a race. So this is why they're all comparable. So this is an interesting evolution of earlier ideas because of course the history of the concept of endogamy itself is very interesting and others have written about it. Uh, most recently Durba Mitro has written very uh, illuminatingly about it, but it's uptake in genetic research and as one of the foundational bases of Indian genetics is actually quite interesting, I think, because one of its consequences is making these different groups all comparable, which in the previous phaseology had put onto different registers. Now, to understand this move, we also have to uh, understand a little about what's happening in uh, the post-war war, uh, scientific discussions of race. One of the things you will see, including in the current, this Indian genome variation stuff that I'm talking about, is that they constantly, they don't deny their lineage from Risley and others. In fact, many of the genome variation uh, uh, publications actually cite Risley as one of the first people to do this research, but then they make a distinction. They say, we are not studying race anymore. We are studying population. And what is the difference? They say race was about finding essences, whereas population is about finding frequencies. So we are not saying that every person of X race is going to have Y trait, but we are saying people of X population will have a higher frequency of getting this Y trait. So this is the distinction they make. The other thing that I've already alluded to that after the Second World War, uh, because genetics is so tainted by its association with Nazism, and Nazism has such a bad um, is politically quite marginalized in the post Second World War era, that uh, genetics survives by professing medical benefits. This is something you'll still see today. The reason people are studying uh, population differences is apparently not because of any innate prejudice or by, uh, bigotry or whatever, but this will allow us to make more uh, targeted pharmaceutical products. And this is actually the floodgates to this was opened in 2005, which is when the Indian stuff also started because the American Food and Drug Administration for the first time gave the green light to a drug called Bidil, which is a heart drug, but which is apparently only specific to African-American hearts. So only if you're an African-American, you can have it. So that drug was allowed to go on the market and this opened up a new entrepreneurial landscape where everybody is, all drug companies are trying to come up with new drugs that are uh, going to be targeted to specific so-called ethnic populations, which is of course code word for race often. Um, and this, uh, this is part of the current, um, current landscape. This is, th that's propelling it, but it, again, it builds on this post second world war uh, medicalization of race research, of presenting race research as, oh, we need to do this because this has medical benefits. The other thing that is constantly uh, cited is that if you look at, uh, the history of race, people will say, in the humanities, we often hear race is a pseudo-scientific idea. It has been rejected by scientists. 
no footnotes are usually available for which scientists rejected this but this is this has become a kind of shibboleth amongst um humanists that apparently scientists have all rejected this if you press further you will see that most often they go back to two unesco statements in the uh, 1950s which actually theodosius lobzanski sangvi's phd supervisor was uh, was in, was one of the authors of and those two unesco statements recently jenny reardon whose book i've got over here uh, has done a extremely good study of those statements what they say and what actually went into the uh, discussions into making producing those statements the statements reject racism but they never reject race in fact they intensify race research they say race we must study race even more the one thing that they do use for that is also this transition because they say that there are no eternal types so all races are mixtures and its frequencies that matter that is why they they call for even more resources into race research because they're like we have to keep studying this we can't settle this we have to study uh, study this even more so what happens is there's a lot of continuity between this pre second world war idea of race and the post second world war notion of population another thing that uh, scholars like veronica liphart have pointed out is that they, we need to make a distinction about what scientists publish in particularly these days in the last 20 25 years scientists have become very careful about what they publish in published papers and there the race word is scrupulously often often avoided however if you look at how they are thinking and how they talk in their labs if you do an ethnography of a lab you'll see a very different uh, um ring to the word that the, the word is not as uh, untouchable as it seems to be in scientific publications furthermore in the age of genomics so uh, the difference between genetics and genomics is genetics was like operating with single genes genomics now claims that they have mapped the entire human genome they know every gene in the human body and they're treating it like a system so that happened at the beginning of the um, uh, 2000s when the first human genome was mapped and then there were these hapmap projects which says no no you can't have a single genome there has to be variation and so they now then the initial hapmap project chose four target populations in africa in india and i think east asia and then did four more maps and now everybody is doing these maps including uh, different nation states um and this genomics like my colleague uh, dorothy roberts whose book i also have here uh, argues that genomics has recreated race for the 21st century it has produced this new entrepreneurial pharmaceutical landscape it has also created a new uh, new kind of legitimacy for race research in the name of medicine it's 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 brought in industry money and it's brought new techniques so uh, so is it race or population if you read any of the indian genome variation consortiums um publications they constantly make this this that oh we are not doing what risley was doing even though it's in the same genealogy but there was a significant break after the second world war we moved to population when we need to be a little more circumspect about taking that break seriously we also need to go beyond this kind of humanities mythology that all scientists have re rejected race and race is a pseudo scientific idea firstly the word pseudo science uh, has no actual meaning it's an actors category that one scientist uses against another um and there's no and i can give you lots of examples for that but i can also just cite you to um, or point you towards michael gordon a very eminent historian of science he's got a very nice book on pseudo science on how pseudo science as a word is used by one scientist against another and there's no consistent definition that you can find for what is science and what is pseudo science so anyway one thing that does change however in the post world war era and this new post -war, second world war idea of race is that race is no longer imagined as eternal unchanging types it is seen to be dynamic and historical they can come into being and then disappear again so um and th this shortens the time required for the creation of race to a mere 2 300 years so you can say that a race has been a new race has been created by 200 years or 300 years of genetic isolation 
So what you get from the 1940s, 50s onwards is an increasing interest in, or a completely obsessive interest, I would say, in what are called genetic isolates. So groups that are apparently genetically isolated through reproductive isolation. In most cases, this means that the studies focus on communities living in small islands. So Pacific islands become a hotspot for genetic research or mountain communities, cut off communities in mountains, communities that live in forests. These become communities that are specially targeted for genetic research. However, in India, particularly through the uh, role of Sangvi, caste is put forward as an equally important uh, mode of genetic isolation. They say that this is, this is a kind of social isolation, even though castes are not geographically cut off, they live in the same villages and cities as everybody else, but each caste, because of this idea of endogamy, is, uh, is genetically cut off, and therefore they behave like uh, races. So they don't always call it races, they'll call it population. So sometimes like SR Das, whom I started with, he will call it a race, many others will. Um, but sometimes these days more consistently, they're all called populations. But central to it is once again, this idea of perfect endogamy. Now, again, I'm not unpacking endogamy here because others have done it much better than I can. But if you want in the q and I can talk more about that. Um, but this is important to keep in mind that it makes race historical, that it can come into being and it can disappear. They don't have to be like, that doesn't need to be five or seven fixed races forever. Now, this is where biometric nationalism also comes in. Biometric nationalism is my phrase, which I've used in a few publications before, and I, uh, I'm proposing. And uh, what I see, what I am trying to signal by uh, talking about biometric nationalism is that this technocratic dream that emerges in the 20s and 30s that somehow questions of national belonging can be worked out by some kind of technical study. Uh, so for instance, the, this is uh, initially used in uh, Gujarat and Bengal, like I say, and if I give you an example, it will probably become clearer that in, in Gujarat at that point, it's all part of the Bombay state. And the, uh, there's a the Gujarat uh, um, Maha Gujarat movement is beginning, which is trying to separate uh, the Gujarati speaking areas from the Marathi speaking areas. And the Dangs pose a problem because they're not sure whether the Dangs belong with the Gujaratis or the Marathis. So what do they do? They go and hire a couple of physical anthropologists, Iravati Karve and, uh, and D.N. Majumdar, uh, to go and do blood group research on these people. And blood groups were the first kind of, you know, uh, they were the easiest to map genetic trait. So, so as if that is going to settle the issue. So there is this hope that that would settle the issue. Similarly, in Bengal in 1942, you know, in the midst of Quit India, when the whole country is falling apart, particularly in Bengal, there's a lot of violence. PC Mahalanobis, the statistician who is very interested in race, uh, again gets CR Rao, who was his student then, but would go on to make up greatest statisticians in the world, C.R. Rao and D.N. Majumdar again, get them together to go and study the Hindus and Muslims of all the Bengal districts to see whether they're more, whether they belong closer uh, together or they belong, or they're closer to other Hindus and other Muslims in neighboring provinces respectively. So no, nothing politically comes of this, but there's this dream that some kind of a technological solution can be found, found to all these complicated questions of national belonging that are beginning to surface in uh, the 20s and 30s as we progress towards decolonization. And in the midst of this appears B.S. Guha, the first man to actually have a PhD in anthropology from Harvard. And you can see this is the title page of his Harvard dissertation. Uh, the, and the topic was the racial basis of the caste system of India. Now, B.S. Buha is the man who actually creates the Anthropological Survey of India. Again, we all know the Anthropological Survey, but very few, I think, know its history. It's not a colonial creation. It's created in November 1946 uh, on a proposal that is tabled by B.S. Guha and supported by some uh, British superiors, but it is mainly Guha's child. And it... It is created initially as a department, then becomes a survey. But November 1946, we can hardly call this a 
uh, colonial institution like say the trigonometric survey or even the botanical survey and all those things happened much earlier. But anthropology and uh, this kind of use of anthropology as part of statecraft is something that is a very nationalist endeavor. And this is what this is what I'm calling biometric nationalism, this kind of technocratic idea that we have a diverse population, but diversity can be measured and somehow uh, intractable questions of political belonging can somehow be illuminated or worked out through a technocratic intervention. Again, I can speak more to this later if you want. So now let me get back to senses. I've gone far away from the sensory part of my talk. So let's get back to the sensory part. Um, what um, at the heart of this is, as you saw in uh, the title of uh, Das's article, was this uh, very big word, phenyl theocarbamide. Uh, it's called PTC for short. It's a chemical. Uh, and it tastes bitter to some people, while other people can't taste it at all. It was accidentally discovered in 1931 by Arthur Fox, who was a chemist at the DuPont laboratory. DuPont is, of course, a big chemical manufacturer that makes a lot of plastics and, um, and fertilizers and things like that. And he was working at the DuPont lab and he had a, like, he was working with this chemical and the, uh, a jar burst. And there was a guy called C.R. Noller, also a scientist working next to him. And he immediately said, oh my goodness, this is so bitter. And uh, Fox couldn't taste it. So Fox was like, whoa, what's happening? And so he then does studies and he finds that some people just don't taste it while others find the taste intensely bitter. So this becomes one of the first non-blood group uh, traits, genetic traits, which are apparently inheritable that are easy to map. It's very easy to do this test. And here I have uh, a chit from an envelope that they were using in American tests, where in America it becomes like, it, they would set it up at big fairgrounds. If there's a big fair, they would have a stall with a couple of scientists. They would hand out these small packets saying, just taste it and tell us what you're feeling and, and vote on this machine. It became a kind of a fairground game as well. But they gathered a lot of data like that. And it became one of the easy genetic traits to study, um, whether you can taste PTC or not. It's taken up in, in now interestingly, Fox himself initially studied and denied any racial variation. He's like all the groups that I have studied have the same breakdown about three out of four people taste it and one out of four don't taste it. And that is kind of equal over different groups that um, I have studied. However, despite Fox's denunciation, people start racializing it. Uh, and Fox is not the only one. Other people also say that it doesn't have any racial, uh, this thing, but uh, still others and a much larger number of people, a larger number of scientists actually do take it up as a marker of racial frequencies. In India, the first studies are done by Sangvi, who I've already quoted, along with his mentor, uh, V.R. Khanolkar, again, a very eminent uh, scientist, um, um, a big military medical family, actually, but this, uh, this Kanolka didn't go in the military, but he's a very, very eminent scientist. Um, and it's taken up in the late 1940s uh, by Sandhya and Kanolka. After that, it's progressively taken on by a number of, uh, by the 40, mid to late 40s, like I said. So uh, again, look at the date. It's late 40s, 1948, 49, right after independence. That's when this starts happening. Uh, you also have, as I said, the emergence of the anthropological survey after independence becomes a huge source of patronage for this kind of anthropological research. In fact, by the 1980s, the anthropological survey is the largest single employer of people called anthropologists in the world. It's the single largest global uh, employer of uh, anthropologists. And yet the anthropology they do is often not recognized at all by university anthropology departments. So that is another interesting thing. Um, in the 50s and 60s, we see at least 30 full-scale studies that I've been able to find of this trait being mapped. These are mostly done in ASI, but some of them are also done in the many new anthropology departments that are coming up in the country. Uh, the, the traditional big ones used to be Calcutta, Bombay, and Lucknow, uh, which were had strong anthropology departments. But then you start getting Chandigarh, Delhi, Utkal University in Katak, coming up as important sources, and many of them are also doing this research. Uh, 
So uh, this sounds very easy. Okay, you give a test to someone, either they taste it or they don't, and you you work out their genetics. The devil again is in the detail. So if you have come across any genetics literature, you'll hear the word phenotype and genotype. So phenotype is what is observable, what is on the outside. And this is a word that geneticists actually borrowed from botanists in the 1910s, in 1910 actually. And it like, because botany at that point was about taxonomizing. They saw plants and then decided which family it fit into. So it was a visual trait. Phenotype em emphasized, the notion of phenotype was entirely emphatically grounded in uh, visual traits. Uh, so taste already created a problem. Now, what kind of problems did it create? Well, one of Fox's own early collaborators, uh, Francis uh, Blakesley, who worked at Carnegie Mellon uh, University, Blakesley uh, found three major problems. One is he saw that there was a psychological expectation often changed it. Right? Like I can't tell whether you are tasting it bitter. If I give you something, I have to rely on your verbal communication, whether you taste or don't taste it. And what Blakesley found is that when subjects are, um, they have a psychological expectation. They've been told that you'll find it bitter. They tend to find it bitter more quickly than others. So this creates a quirk in the uh, experiment. Second, there was linguistic mediation. He also found that depending on language competence, so he wasn't thinking of people speaking different language, but he found that particularly with kids uh, who hadn't yet clearly learned all the taste words, it was a difficulty to do the research because they couldn't tell what language, uh, they couldn't distinguish between tastes because the language competency was not there. Finally, he saw that tasting is also a kind of a learnt behavior. So one interesting uh, insight from Blakesley's research was that he saw that in uh, America and in, in actually the Northeast corner, the place where the region that I'm based in now, this region, he, he did most of his research here, but he saw that when he uh, tested it on uh, people who were from the villages, they would often compare the taste to dandelions, the, uh, the, the small dandelion flowers that grow in the meadows. And when they asked people in the cities, they would often compare it to some very uh, bitter medicine. So he came to the conclusion that people were also kind of thinking about taste. It was a learned behavior and it was learned by correlating it to things you were familiar with. So because kids in the villages play in meadows and keep chewing on these dandelions, that's the taste that they think of as bitter. Whereas in the cities, these medicines become the template. What is remarkable is that practically no Indian researcher ever even seriously considers these problems. And this is despite the fact that you're often having researchers research subjects whose languages they don't speak. So you might have a guy from Lucknow go to the Andamans and do this research, but he will never even consider that what were the local words for bitterness, how, how was uh, that conveyed, was anything missed in that. There's no consideration of this. There's a kind of technocratic hubris almost that overrides any of this. Um, on the other hand, the, the part that they did concern themselves with more was the experimental alternatives, because by the late 1940s, when the Indian researchers start, several foreign researchers have already put forward different methods. One, so there are three simple alternatives. One is you can use a crystal of this PTC chemical and put one crystal on the tip of your tongue and see whether you can taste it. You can also make it into a solution with water. And then how much dilution is a big question. Different researchers use different levels of solution. So how much water you mix, how much salt with, and then what kind of glass you give it in. And finally, there's this thing that I've got a picture of, these small little paper slips that are already saturated with PTC and you put the slip on the tip of your tongue and then you uh, decide. So these created a lot of discussion as to which uh, which method to use, what are the benefits, what are the problems with each of the methods that the Indian researchers did worry about. There was also uh, some uh, data to show that, the, that your ability to taste varied with temperature. If you were very high in the mountains um, and it was very cold, your 
ability to taste varied than if you were in the plains and you were in a very warm place. Similarly, water quality variation. So they tried the international standard was to try and use distilled water. But because these scientists often in India often went to study communities that were not well connected, distilled water was difficult to carry. It was not always in good supply. So they had to rely on local water sources, which could be river water, pond water, lake water. And those water qualities definitely created a variation in the taste. Uh, and this is attested to by other uh, international researchers who are very um, and Indian researchers are aware of this, but they don't have an alternative because they can't take water along and they don't have regular water supply. Then there is also the question of the material of the cup in which you have been given the water. Is it a, like, is it a lota, uh, a brass lota? Is it a copper vessel? Is it a, st a steel vessel? Is it plastic? Is it paper? And they keep on like, and this also creates uh, minor variations. Uh, another problem is with medical masking. So as you know, many people in India used to and still do suffer from uh, repeated bouts of malaria. And if you've had malaria several times, and if you've had to have quinine several times, your sense of particularly the bitter taste is somewhat warped because quinine itself was very bitter. And if you've had it for a long time, it kind of dulls your uh, taste ability. So there's a kind of medical masking that's, which they call medical masking. And this is something I'll come back to soon um, that's going on. Uh, and finally, there's this idea of thresholds and filtering. So uh, one of the things that British researchers found was that it is incorrect to make a clear distinction between taster and non-taster because some people would not be able to taste a very light solution, but they would be able to taste a very strong solution. So, so what the British researchers started proposing is that we have to have threshold values. Without threshold values, taster, non-taster doesn't make sense. Some people do taste, but lightly. Some people taste a very strong solution. Uh, and this binary is a false binary. You have to make it into a graded spectrum and then organize your data. So this is again, something that is, um, and where you draw that threshold boundary, this is where various kinds of statistical calibrations came in. And I can go into that statistical part of the story if you want, but all that I want to flag here is the basic uh, problem or basic idea that these are all technological mediations. There's no such, so what appears at first that, oh, you have some people who can taste it and some people who can't. That's not true. What you have are people who can taste particular versions of it, either in solution or paper or crystal in particular quantities under particular temperatures given in a particular vessel. And finally, most importantly, this threshold value where that is going to be, where you're going to draw the line between taster and non-taster is something that is entirely reliant on the methods that are statistical methods that are used by uh, different researchers. So the phenotypes that appear to be so obvious are definitely more a construction of the particular uh, methods being used in research. Now this then leads us to another uh, interesting dimension of this story, which is about uh, true tasters, designating truth tasters. Once you get into this conundrum, we see that there are two phenomena that are problematic. One is masking and masking I have already alluded to this kind of um, where apparently because you've had some medicine, it has become um, your taste buds have become dulled. Uh, and we're not just talking of biomedical things. We are also talking about home remedies. So if you talk, think of home remedies, some very popular ones are methi chewing, which is quite a common practice in particularly Western India for many health giving benefits. Um, and chireta, uh, which is intensely bitter. I can attest to this. My mother made me have it all my childhood. So it's very bitter. And you put it, you put the sticks in water overnight and then you drink that water. Now, all these things affect your ability and your sensitivity to uh, taste, or that's the argument. Uh, but the one thing that is singled out most by the researchers is pan. They sort of zero in on pan and several uh, researchers, particularly in, the, in Delhi and Chandigarh, study the effects of pan or regular pan chewing on 
quote unquote, masking the true genetic identity. So they find some people who actually cannot taste this PTC, or, um, but their genetic uh, the genetic model they have of if their mom and dad both had it, the uh, son or daughter should have it, but the son or daughter doesn't. And how do you explain this? You then explain it by saying, oh, but this daughter uh, habitually chews pan all the time and that is why she can no longer taste it. So um, masking becomes a way of cancelling out the real perception. So now by talking of true tasters, you can actually forget what the person is actually tasting. The person's phenotypical taste of what she is telling you is becomes immaterial. An even more complicated thing arises with the sweetness. So a Swedish researcher called Gunnar Skude uh, actually builds on some early findings of SR Das, but then goes on to write more extensively and do much more research on this, where uh, Gunnar Skude uh, finds that a very small proportion of people, not only do they not taste PTC as bitter, but they actually taste it as a sweet substance. And this seems to go the other way altogether. This is, uh, SR Das estimates that about 2% of the Indian population might be people who taste it sweet. But this seems to be a very complicated business that what, like, how can you explain this? This is, of course, nowadays it would be explained by more complex genetic mechanisms saying it's not a single gene model. There are multiple genes that interact, but I'm not getting into that. In the 1960s, they had a mainly a one gene model, which did not explain this at all and would have completely undermined the research. But Das simply says that, well, we can always exclude those people from our findings. So it's a simple technique whereby you just leave them out from the data. And once again, the actual perception of these people has been canceled out. So you can see the technological mediation here where the actual phenomenological experience of taste is increasingly becoming redundant. It's becoming inconsequential. So let me get to this bitter sweetness because this is an interesting idea. Why are people or how are people tasting it? as sweet and what, what do we do with this? Well, if you look at uh, early Bengali to English dictionaries, um, at, till the middle of the 19th century, after that they start changing, till the middle of the 19th century, what is interesting is that the word tikto, which is usually the word for bitter, one of the major words for bitter, is often described in English as bitter, aromatic, fragrant. Um, even more interestingly, if you look in Southeast Asia, there is a taste, they, they widely recognized taste called pahit, which is a bittersweet taste. And it's not like, it's actually, we are calling it bittersweet, but it's in a way it's not translatable. So pahit is in places like Malaysia, you have people who talk about this taste pahit and there's even now there's a alcoholic drink called pahit because it apparently has that taste. Even more interesting perhaps is if you look at early modern Nighantus and Dravyagunas, which give you the rasas of different substances uh, from a mostly medical point of view, um, at least the ones that I've consulted, which are the major ones in the Bengal region. Karela uh, and Chireta, which are probably the two most bitter things I can think of, are not described as bitter. That's really strange. They're described in other, through other rasas, but they're not described as bitter. On the other hand, you do have some uh, edible stuff like Kalkashundia Shag, which is described as bittersweet. Also, the uh, Dravyagunas make a distinction between Tikta Rasa as an abstract principle and the actual bitter taste of things. So one of the things that are described as bitter are rattan canes, canes with which you're beaten. Now, I'm not sure whether that description was actually talking about people eating canes and finding them bitter or the bitterness caused by uh, by the beatings that you get. But most interesting is Pan, this villain of the piece for the scientists, because for the scientists, Pan was what really hid true genetic identity. What do the uh, these Dravya Gunas have to say? Well, again, the Rajvallabhya Dravya Gun, which is the most popular one in the Bengal region, authored in late 17th century, possibly, um, or a very early 18th century. Um, that when it comes to pan, it says upon the addition of spices, etc. This is the whole entry for pan. Uh, upon the addition of spices, etc. It is acrid, bitter, sweet, astringent flavor. So 
four rasas have been combined to describe its uh, this thing its potency is hot uh, it destroys wind phlegm and worms it effectuates the libido rati shakti is an ornament when speaking to women it is lovable and vanquishes sorrow um and i have here a picture of a kalighat painting of the famous elokeshi nobin mohanto scandal that tanika sarkar and tapti roy and people have written about and you can see popular descriptions of these adulterous lovers is them exchanging paan so paan is part of this matrix of like an whole affective milieu which brings together uh libido uh, uh joy also some medical benefits and it's but it's actual discrete taste is somehow slippery because four different tastes are or what we translate as taste four rasas are combined to describe it um so this is what brings me to uh, the question of taste and affect and before that i should also point out that uh, that nobin mohanto uh, elokeshi image is not uh, a one off you have lots of images like these images i've taken from the welcome collection these are made in south india they're from the uh, their company school drawings from uh, early 19th century and they show different castes and whenever they show a man and woman together they're exchanging pun so this is a uh, this is a cultural motif in some way of the exchange of pun being uh, being a a part of this kind of um affective inter uh, gender relationship so anyway i i'll just put it aside for the moment and um uh, raise the larger question of are there only a fixed number of discrete measurable universal tastes this is the question that the scientists think that bitter is bitter everywhere in the world it's just one taste everybody has the same taste and we can find a way to measure it so ben hymor uh, writes about affect uh, and taste uh, talks of the sticky entanglements between matter and affect that interrupt what i'm called the bureaucratic business of sorting and cataloging tastes so you want to separate out taste to make it a bureaucratic object something that can be measured something that can be cataloged sorted but the sticky entanglements between matter and affect kind of transcend that taste on is only partially separable from the social habitus within which it is implicated so hymore calls for a fleshy sociology of tastes indian researchers like i have said not only did they not bother with any sociology they often times never even knew the language of their subjects and wanted to like completely come at this from this kind of externalist high high up uh, bureaucratic perspective and this is what i want to call genosense now i'm borrowing the idea of genosense from um sarah tracy another uh, um scholar who studies sci science and the social impact of science she has talked about uh, what she describes as chemosense in the context of umami um, which has now become this uh, apparently the sixth taste uh umami is by the way like if you've had ajinomoto it's that taste so it's a uh, it's a japanese it's apparently a japanese specific taste but that has now been uh taste researchers scientists have made a big deal of it uh, identified it as chemically authentically a sixth new taste and they're also trying to reproduce it chemically uh so sarah tracy calls this the creation of a chemosense where the uh the phenomenology of taste becomes secondary to the chemistry of taste and it is she implicates it within a contemporary big food industry which wants to market taste in a particular way and reproduce taste as well but my actors are not doing chemosense clearly they are doing something different they are doing genosense uh which is reducing the uh, sensory to the genetic but this is also uh then making the genes uh making the senses discrete and corpuscular sortable purely geneticized unrelated to the perceptions or affects that they're embedded in but even more importantly and in distinction from the contemporary move towards chemo senses it does not have an industry dimension no industry is sponsoring this research this is sponsored by the indian government and this is racially marked that is i think in interesting and supremely important for post colonial india that this early post colonial state is sponsoring this research and it is constituting genosense as a tech it's a technocratic production 
uh, that allows for the cataloging of sensory subjectivities. So the sensory subjectivities have very little to do with uh, what the person actually tastes. And here you can see a very contemporary uh, depiction of this. Are you tasting for genotype? Uh, are you testing, sorry, for genotype or phenotype? It asks in the illustration. So now genotype and phenotype have be become separate. You might be a non taster, but genetically you might be a taster. Um, and your non tasting can then be cancelled out by saying you, you have your tasting is ma masked, you were unable to taste, whatever. So my final part in this story is SR Das has appeared a lot, but I think he's also parable. He tells us he, in his career, allows us to sum up this change very uh, succinctly. Sensation, as many of you, particularly at CSDS, might remember from Ashishta's alternative science book, J.C. Bose was very interested in, Jagdish Bose was very interested in sensation. Sensation for him had become this kind of almost vitalist surplus that allowed him to pursue a, an apparently alternate pathway in modern science or try to think, imagine a different science. By the, it, uh, in 1917, J.C. Bose set up the Bose Institute in Calcutta as a research institute. By the 1920s, however, again, that interwar era, um, the Bose Institute started receiving state funding. It became an uh, appendage of the state, even though interestingly, their website does not mention this. Uh, in the 1930s, it also becomes the home of the Indian Eugenics Society, about which again, I'm happy to say more. Um, and the people become interested in this kind of racialized genetics. By the 1940s, sensation research has been recalibrated and reframed as biophysics in Bose uh, Institute. And in 1942, S.R. Das, Shudhir Ranjan Das, a young uh, MSc from Calcutta University, an MSc in pure physics, who's interested in the early stuff that Bose was interested in, joins Bose Institute as a research fellow. He, because he's interested in the sensory and the sensations, he gravitates gradually away from physics and towards chemistry, because chemistry is the one field where the senses are taken a little seriously. So if you have any of you, if you've done high school science, you'll know that the ke chemistry lab is where they ask you to smell things, taste things. No other lab does that. Not the biology lab, not the physics lab. It's the chemistry lab that does that. Because the chemistry as a discipline still has a residual investment in non-visual senses. Um, and so he gravitates towards chemistry. He publishes some important papers, goes to Germany to present some papers. But in 1948, a good job comes up. He leaves the Bose Institute and goes to Kabul University as a lecturer. But things in Afghanistan uh, don't pan out. And it, uh, it, within two years, he's out of a job and he's back in India. When he's back in India, he is looking for a job. He gets a job at the Anthropological Survey of India. And his job there is to study, um, relate, x-rays to racial studies. This is the big thing again in the 50s that x-rays are a new thing. So people are doing x-ray studies of hands and saying, seeing whether the bones are similar for different caste groups and different races, etc. So, uh, this is how Das gets into uh, race. Uh, he eventually, by the 60s, as we've seen, he becomes the preeminent authority. Uh, he becomes the main authority in uh, doing these PTC taste studies. In 68, he leaves his job at um, the ASI and goes to the Indian Statistical Institute uh, that Mahalan Nobis had set up and establishes the new human genetics unit. So this is how alternative science gradually gravitates towards technocracy. Uh, so the conclusions, and I will come back to Das in a minute, conclusions we can draw is that race is recreated as a dynamic historical entity after the world, uh, Second World War. It's based on these dubious assertions of endogamy. Uh, it moves towards markers that permit for greater technological management. So unlike the Rizlian characters of like, are you light-skinned, dark-skinned, which beyond a point is kind of visually available even to non-experts. But this PTC stuff is so expert mediated that non-experts can't even tell whether you're really a taster or a non-taster. Sensation itself evolves from a heterodox object at the fringes of mainstream science 
to a highly technolog technologized object in statist biometric nationalism. And here I want to end by showing that how this continues. This map is again, this map I have up here, Cockershoid, Mongoloid, Proto-Australoid, Negrito and their distribution is again from the human genome, uh, sorry, the Indian Genome Variation Consortium's publications and website. You can see it's clearly racialized. Now, this is led by a man called Partho Pratim Mojumdar, a very eminent geneticist who was both trained in the human genetics unit set up by Das at ISI. And now after briefly working in the US, now is back in the ISI working there. And he's the one who leads this. So this whole story about Das that I started with, it's not fortuitous that we have landed up with the Indian Genome Variation Consortium. It's the same institution and the same silsila, as it were, of PhD students who are carrying on this work. So, um, so yeah, so that's why I think we need to study this more. But I'll, I'll, that's my pitch. I will leave it at that and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prajit. Uh, I mean, there are too many, uh, I mean, for me, as somebody who's been working on caste, uh, this has been really uh, a revelation, you know, because uh, if I'm, and you're familiar with the controversy that erupted over 2001, the Durban conference, when, you know, there was vitriolic outrage, literally, and then especially from the academic fraternity, uh, you know, um, at any attempt at trying to see them as a series and caste in conjunction. And I, of course, there is a legacy to historical, I mean, the legacy Ambedkar, whom you have cited in your work, who even, who also disbanded this theory of associating caste with race. But what is striking to me uh, is the fact that here you have um, a post-colonial state, uh, ASI, and this is a situation like in the, in the I mean, we are under the shadow of uh, the world war, the macabre violence of violence that played out during this period. And still we have a post-colonial state which is engaged in this kind of research. That is something shocking. Another thing is the ways in which our academic world, the humanities and the science, they seem, I don't know, this is um, my very limited reading. There seems to be a sign, kind of um, uh, problematic gap. There seems to be a little dialogue between these disciplines. I don't know, I'm not sure. Um, because as you rightly said, there are citations that, that firstly they disband that race has nothing to do with caste, very, um, 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 very um, passionate uh, disavowal of that. But then you have a state sponsored patronized institute which is an engaged consistently through the 60s and 70s in that research and one reason i the end um, of that uh, research seems to be something like to do with managing populations you see now now that the notion of race has changed but i don't know how you know blood groups of particular communities or biometric nationalism would solve those political problems in that sense so for example you say that in gujarat you give the example of trying to bring in this technology of biometrics or uh, seroanthropology to determine the bio uh, caste territorial location of a community I mean, you could go on eternally for uh, doing that. I don't know um, where is, um, if you think about the number of cars that are in India today and the intermixture that has gone through it, it's hugely problematic project, even if you think of it. So I want to, um, I, I don't know if I'm, uh, if I'm really right in trying to say that there has been this gap between science, history of science or um, history of raciology in India and post-colonial India and that of humanities. And where do we bridge? And I see that the this is most remarkable about your work. I think it is a kind of reveals to us those spaces where we can actually think through these uh, lurking problematic, you know, gaps. And that is why I said there was this disenchantment, you know, of you, but you had this uh, imagination of a benign um, or a very um, um, uh, committed state towards uh, elimination of all types of discrimination. And then you have another institution which is indulgent in doing that for whatever reasons, you know, and. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask was it, um, uh, with what I've read, there seems to be a, a, a comparison between communities, 
right Re um, between cars and trying to make an argument you know that they are um, and there seems to be many different uh, studies where there's not much convergence among these studies if i am right you know there seems to be disparity in terms of the arguments that they're making eventually there seems to be no uh, you know concrete uh, end i don't know then what what would be the wisdom that we get from this raciology post colonial raciology what is the wisdom how do we relate race and um, caste if it is um, denied and they don't see this any such denial and if it is positive recognition how is that supposed to be um, you know integrated into reimagining what we supposed to be a more egalitarian kind of society you know what is that is that i don't see that to be the case it seems to be, if you're saying that it's more about managing populations you know i, I don't know how where do you bring the theoretical i mean uh, ethical concerns because if i if I, whatever little i know about the genome project there is this project that is going on and mapping human dna but there's also certain i don't know i mean it seems to be possibly to also have a certain research conducted to look into these ethical matters or um, issues of what are the ends what are the limits of research so does the asi have any such vision or is it engaging in it as it is are there any boundaries or limitations um, of doing such or what is the end eventual end of it that is the first thing and the second thing is about, I mean, this is fascinating because I th see that um, the closest to that history of science that people like me or cult cultural historians can enter this domain is through the phenotype. You know, to see what, as you brilliantly bring about masking or AGCR, what I, if I'm not wrong, or gender trouble. Uh, the way in which uh, you say the ghost of gender, you know, destabilizes the interproject of uh, uh, interproject of raciology because it actually destabilizes the project, you know. So I think these are the only spaces that we have to engage, you know, in trying to um, broaden uh, understanding and also eventually simultaneously retrieve those silent sisters, as you're saying. But uh, what my, my question is also about the fact that. Uh, now, rasa or taste is central to your uh, presentation here. But in this entire uh, project of raciology, are are there other senses to deployed? I mean, the sense of touch, the sense of smell. I mean, blood blood uh, samples or zero anthropology is there anthropometry is old fashioned now for sure so are there other senses and what implications does it have because if you say that now senses are recultivated medicalized and related to larger market processes the state or water biometrics or whatever so what is it um, you know uh, what is the trajectory of other uh, senses within this biometric and and the other thing is about um, um, you know uh, what do we make of i mean the ways in which philosophy of sen uh, philosophy uh, of senses or sensorium or whatever and in in metaphysical traditions or the western phenomenology for that matter are these disconnected entirely is there no mediation possible between these two or how do they function i mean what scope do they have uh, i mean that is a very layman laywoman's question for that matter so uh, that is one thing um, and um, the, uh, so I, I, will, I will stop here for the moment and then let uh, you respond to those questions and there may be other comments from my colleagues. Thank you so much Vijayashri for these wonderful questions, uh, especially because they, um, and I'm, I'm so thankful that you brought up the gender bit because I couldn't get it into the time frame, but you read the paper, so it's there in the paper. That it's, it's such a, such a glaring gap that they always map the gender uh, difference. And if they add that in and they calculate, then this racial difference will disappear. So it's just a mathematical this thing, but they keep on saying it's statistically insignificant. And like I say in the paper that recently, like over 800 leading scientists published a paper in Nature, a letter actually to Nature, um, they signed it and published it saying that this idea of statistical insignificance is complete bunkum. It allows all kinds of prejudice to enter into scientific objectivity. Now that's anyway, it's, uh, it's not in the time period that I'm talking about and scientific objectivity itself is something I have problems with, but it's interesting that even scientists now recognize that, that it's a very prejudicial way of leaving out things that don't fit your model. So the gender question is really interesting and important. Um, 
let me take some of the other questions um and like you know i was also struck by the disparity and what is the point of these studies i mean who's like nothing is happening like nowadays you know these like sarah tracy's work that i mentioned with this ajinomoto umami there i can see what is happening that some company is paying you money because they want to create this some food product that they'll make money out of but the indian state is not getting anything directly out of it it's not helping them actually manage the population so why so i my answer is twofold one is i think that there is this promise constantly being a carrot uh, in front of the donkey that it will eventually it will help us solve these problems technocratically there's this huge technocratic dream second is uh, that for individual researchers the sheer number of new university departments that open up in the country uh, doing physical anthropology and as i'm sure you know in india there's a curious thing that most of what in the west is known as cultural anthropology in india happens in sociology departments mm -hmm. in anthropology departments have become overwhelmingly just physical anthropology so it becomes a root for a lot of young men and women to write phd thesis simple as that and and i actually in my book uh, which this is a part of the last chapter i have a discussion of how for sangvi often it is just this very mundane thing that this is oh you know this i can get 50 more phd's out of this <laughs> topic and so there's a kind of intensification of research that is happening that's not necessarily driven by any actual utility there's a vague promise of some utility but there's an intensification of research into the topic because people are just making because it's also about make you know at that individual level of careers of somebody getting a promotion from reader to full professor or whatever it's that kind of academic politics also that's happening here uh and that's why i think these new patronage institutions are also interesting it's not just individual researchers like uh chris fuller is has just written a excellent biography of risley where he shows that most of risley's race research didn't actually enter into policy stuff in the colonial state it was almost on the side so but this is different this is now we are post colonial india like i said asi is the world's biggest employer of anthropologists by the 1980s so you need to give them something to do so this is how the middle classes who are the only people who uh, even now usually become uh, uh, university students and scientists and scholars whatever they are making careers out of this uh, the point about humanities again excellent point and this is again like you know this is what i started with that when i was a student i never read any of this i read all about the pre first world war era but why did we think that scientists had forgotten about this who said that who defined pseudo science who said like all the people every time every publication even the publications on risley that you will get you'll see all the historians call it pseudo scientific who has said this is pseudo scientific who who has decided where the boundaries of science lie this is again because of this incredible and i think that again goes back to the post colonial states education policies in a way which where we are asked to track so early on as to whether your humanities or your science and then you don't read the other stuff you get tracked and then you're scared of the sciences you're like oh i i don't do that uh whereas in for instance in the american setting i know that even people who go into medical school have to do four years of an un undergrad they might be doing it in history uh, before they apply to medical school you can't this indian business of like in class 7 or whenever you choose whether you're going to be a scientist or a humanist and then you forget the other half that's a very peculiar indian phenomenon that's i think produced this kind of lack of conversation um the ethical aspects again is remarkable that the asi does not so far as i can tell do any of that and i think part of that is again because of this bifurcation that you were talking about this because there are no humanists this is these are all lab scientists the best they can do if they're geneticists the best they do is they go and talk to asi and asi itself is a bunch of lab scientists so nobody has the skills and this is important for another reason again as um, a number of people alexandra widmer veronica lipart and people have pointed out that genetics research because it is the starting point the presumption is about who has reproduced with whom that's a social question you're starting from that there is no way of getting a biological truth before that and so in doing that um you have to deal with non biological sources of data 
from oral narratives, written uh, histories, family stories. Um, people have geneticists in the US I know have also used like family Bibles to see who was married to whom. So this is, but these guys don't have the skills to decode that. It's humanists who have the skills to decode that, but there is no conversation. So even if I don't reject the science itself, I will say that the scientists, they are dealing with data that they don't have the skills to understand or analyze. And that is so central to the work they're doing. Often it is, if you read these genetic studies, it's ludicrous what kind of history books they cite. One very top notch publication, for instance, that I came across cited some like Chaman Lal's Hindu America as a authoritative history book, which is a like, you know, this kind of weird history book saying Maya's were, it's like P.N. Oak's work that says that, oh, you know, England was actually Angulistan and, uh, and this is in, Hindus discovered everything. It's that kind of a book. And this is getting published in an international journal. So even the referees don't know what to make of this. So I think that is one of the major problems. So I will, I'll, I'll stop here. There were several other questions, but I, I know I'm taking too much time. So maybe I can come back to them with the other questions. So uh, this question from, uh, huh? Yeah, you, you can go online if you. And Deepu's name. Yeah, yeah Deepu, go ahead. Yeah, uh, th thank you. Thank you, Project. Uh, wonderful, uh, you know, a lot of things to, to think about. I had two slightly unrelated questions. Uh, one has to do with this uh, uh, thing about a post-racial race uh, that somehow wants to uh, use this idea of, of uh, a race being formed in 300 years or, or you know something like that to suggest that they are post-racial. So they're not racial in the old sense. But that doesn't seem possible with caste. Uh, you know, so in that sense, there does remain this fundamental difference of how one looks at these two systems of, of uh, difference uh, because that is a far more difficult argument to make with caste and and so i just wanted your thoughts on that uh, especially since you came back to this question of endogamy three four times saying you will speak about it so so this is your chance uh, the other one is uh, on the issue of uh, taste now i know you're coming at it uh, from from more from the history of science thing but since you brought up the pan, uh, it seems that there's a lot more to be said about taste being acquired in a relationship. So I'm, I'm thinking of something like, if you, if you look at uh, Dipesha's old article on the Gri Lakshmi and, and why the Bengali housewife mother figure had to be the cook and not a hired cook because the taste differed with who was cooking. So, so there's a way in which this whole phenomenon of taste uh, has to do with relationships. And, and I was wondering if you could say something to that. Thank you very much. Both excellent questions. I completely agree with you that there's a kind of, um, there's this kind of image of the post-racial that is being invoked in, um, in, these, um, in these studies. What I'm not sure is when does that happen? Um, it does not happen in my period. So it does not happen in the Nehruvian period. My, I'm stopping in 1966, which is basically the Nehruvian period. Um, and that's also like to go back to Vijayashree's thing that that's also interesting, I think, about the post-colonial state, because that's the period we think of as somehow more enlightened than the periods we've been in subsequently. And they were doing this at that time. Um, and they are, like I showed with that very first study that I started, they are, die they, they are not squeamish about using the word race. Some of these people like Sangvi, who are more networked into American politics, they are beginning to stop using it. But like Das, or there's another man I'm, uh, I've looked at a lot in my book, S.S. Sarkar, uh, who also trains a huge generation of um, scholars after him. They all, they are absolutely adamant that we have to use the word race. So it's not post-racial at that point. So that's my first part of the answer. Second part is the difference with caste. Yes, I, I absolutely agree that caste might be a different matrix from race. 
What I'm saying is that there's an attempt by these scientists, these Indian scientists, to render caste as this recreated race. And that's where caste becomes comparable for them to like religious communities, to tribes, everything, which is also, you know, interesting because Sanghi had published one paper, which was from his master's thesis in Bombay before he comes to the US. And in that he's much more sensitive towards the nuances of caste in practice. So he's like, oh, you know, in, uh, there's nothing called a Brahmin in Bombay, you have different types of Brahmins and then they'll have like different Gotras. And so he goes into like Gotra and all this and like he tries very hard to, to model that. He, he has a background in statistics. So he's trying to model that at that point. When he comes to America and goes back after that, he starts peddling this complete cardboard stereotype that all castes are perfectly endogamous. They've been endogamous since Adam and that that is why they're discrete uh, racial groups. Or the, again, like race population, that slippage is happening. But so they are not making much of a difference with caste other than the fact that they are actually saying in certain ways, caste is an even more kind of well-bounded thing to study. And the context for this is the bigger debate is that uh, there were two bigger scientists, Dobzhansky on the one hand and Muller, who also got the Nobel Prize, uh, about whether um, uh, mutations are good in a population or not whether muta genetic mutations are good. And Muller actually is a communist. So he, he thinks that mutations are bad, but he is also a eugenicist who thinks that eventually we need to produce good communists, eugenically. And so he is trying to, and this debate, they're like, and Dobzhansky comes back and says, oh, you know, how are we going to settle this? Because we only work with Drosophila fruit flies that have four genes and human beings are not magnified Drosophila. You can't study human beings like this. And then Sanvi says, well, here is because human lifetimes are so big, we can't study it. System, we have this already studied for us. So this is an ancient model that's already 